I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is the financial workshop of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, November 18th, 2019 at 7 p.m. here at El Sierra School. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hanna. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Salanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. There will be an extended public comment period following the workshop presentation. We ask that anyone intending to make a comment during that time, please fill out a card and turn it in at this time so we can adhere to our 30-minute time frame to give everyone a fair opportunity to speak. Here at the table there behind me. Um, and then at this point, we're going to go ahead and just kick off the financial workshop, go right in with uh, Todd Rayfall. Okay, we'll go with this one. <laughs> Green may be a little hard to read with the numbers, but we'll go through it. Um, so th this is the revenue side, uh, as the board <laughs> has just approved the levy uh, at its last meeting, uh, and you know, we, we had a presentation of that back in October. We thought we would kind of break up uh, the whole projection and, and next budget as we're entering into fiscal year 21 budget uh, preparation and talk a little bit more about resources uh, this evening as well as uh, the board at the, when it approved, thank you, better, uh, approved the budget for FY20 uh, had a concern about fund balance. So we have a conversation about that as well. And as well as, and then we have some pieces we want to talk about, um, about comparison of local resources to other area elementary districts. Uh, we have kind of you know, put some tables together to kind of illustrate uh, where Downers Grove 58 is comparison to neighbors as far as local resource allocation, uh, resources available, mainly tax levy and, and the AG. So the first part we want to talk about is, is, is financial resources and breakdown of, of where our revenue comes from. Obviously, the majority of our revenue comes from property taxes and real estate. We have, on the local level, corporate personal property replacement tax, though we get it from the state, it's considered a local tax. It is <coughs> the replacement of the corporate personal property tax that was ex extinguished with the 1970 Constitution. There's a formula and an allocation that goes back to 1970 or 1972. This amount is about $880,000 for the district this year. So it's a fair amount of money, in, you know, it's based on a, you know, what is a fairly old formula, uh, but it is a considerable piece. So we have interest income, which is a growing piece, and then our local fees, uh, which are our Oak Keep revenue, uh, transportation fees that we charge for uh, students that, you know, for transportation, a small amount, and registration fees. The reason I put the Oak Keep revenue piece in there is because oftentimes a lot of people talk about wanting to look at that, you know, we have half-day kindergarten with a full-day option. And, you know, the fees that we have for that are based on expenses and what it is for that extra half a day. And roughly it's about a million dollars a year. Uh, so, you know, one piece we, and we've had some meetings with parents last year with their question and concern about, you know, wanting to switch that out. and you know, we wanted to just bring attention to that, that in fact, to replace that, to put the simply full day, would be a million dollar impact if we didn't collect that. So somewhere else we would have to find that, that revenue. On the state level, we have the evidence-based funding model, uh, which we'll go into a little bit. Um, that is third year now for the evidence-based funding. Uh, going into fourth year, it is a shift that had been uh, from the previous system that's been around for forever, which was uh, the general state aid formula. Uh, the evidence-based model uh, is a more 
structured format that has, has a lot of different indicators and a lot of different factors into it. It is also a model that is used in many other states. We have reimbursements for uh, special ed and transportation, and those are reimbursements prorated from the prior year. So the, the, the expenses for special ed, for tuition uh, mainly, as well as transportation uh, that we spent this year, we will receive, we submit reports and receive those next year. Um, to add a little bit of even more convolutedness to it, we are a year behind in one of those payments. We get four payments a year. Uh, the one payment we have that came in in the fall was from two fiscal years ago because they're just off by one, one piece. Hopefully someday the state will be able to catch up and give five payments a year. Uh, Additionally, we have a pre-K uh, block grant, which helps uh, with, uh, with a significant funding for the pre-K program. Federal funding, the best way to think about federal funding is it follows students in need. It follows either on, you know, based on poverty or on um, a special ed and additional pieces like that with the individual IDEA grant uh, that the district receives a large amount for, as well as title funds, which are poverty or low income based. And those, when we talk about federal funds, we're talking about those are in addition to local and state. Um, we must supplement programs, not supplant. And that's always a piece that we're, we're wanting to make sure we maintain because we can't replace local or state money with federal. Let's talk a little bit about the evidence base. Since many of you are going to the, the conference this weekend, uh, I thought we'd give a quick background, a couple slides on the evidence-based funding model. The model is based on about 28, I think it started out 22 and now 28, 30 different factors that the state takes into consideration when creating what is the adequacy target for a school district. Uh, it's based on enrollment, it's based on um, number of students in gifted program, number of students with special ed needs, uh, how many librarians you need per student per building, um, and it has a you know fairly large factor. There is a regional-based structure, so Chicagoland area. There's a six percent multiplier put on that piece to determine to add to what should be the cost for an adequate uh, educational funding, and then it compares the local funding level and then it figures out what you need to get up to that adequacy target or 100%. There are four tiers, actually. Um, these are different tiers than the tiers that Justin talked about last week. I actually sent an email to someone from the state and said, uh, you guys need to figure out how to do something different about tiers because something should be categories or whatever. Um, <laughs> tier one is districts that are under that 67% adequacy. Those are the districts that need additional funding. Tier two is 67 to 90. Tier three is 90 to 100. Tier four is 100%. Um, and you can see the breakdown there. Now, there are 850 school districts, and you'll look at those numbers and say, no, you can't do math, that's more than 850 school districts. Included in those numbers are regional office of education um, and other special districts that are in there that also receives some of that funding. So that's why you're going to see over the amount. But it gives you a sense. As to from, this is all uh, from the state board website. So it kind of gives you a sense as to how many districts are in each tier and where the money flows. Uh, do you mind sharing what does adequacy mean? What adequacy mean? Yeah, how do they decide what percentage of what is adequate? Every district has a different adequacy target because it's based on enrollment and the type of students that are enrolled. So if you have a high number of special ed students, that has an allocation cost as to how much it takes to, to educate a special ed student. If you have a gifted student that are listed as that, there's an additional amount that's allocated. Then it gets down to how many square feet, you know, how many? how many square footage or how much custodians you should have, teachers, base cost for teachers. So the target itself can vary, particularly from region to, to district to district. Yeah, that's a great question. 
one of the things that they're looking for in the evidence-based funding model is they came out with, a, I believe it's 27 factors that they shared that every school should have in order to provide an adequate education. And so what ends up happening is then the state sets your per pupil adequacy target. And then depending on how far away from you are on that target will determine your funding. So right now, District 58 is, is listed at 98% adequacy, meaning the state is telling us that according to their model, we're right about where we should be. There's an interesting provision in the law if your district is over 110% adequacy target, you can have a what, what's known as a reverse referendum where they, the voters can, can say you're spending too much money. Um, to put it in perspective where I was coming from, uh, in my last district in Chicago Ridge, when we started this, we were at 48% adequacy target. So we would have been a tier one school district that got a big influx of money where our state funding really isn't changing because we're at our adequacy target. Um, to Todd's point though, it is a very complex formula how they determine that adequacy target, but that's why we find ourselves in tier three. Um, tier four districts would be those ones that are typically surpassing that 110% mark. So the funding structure, the adequacy piece is to, and the, the evidence-based funding model when it was adopted was essentially to help those districts in getting to that higher level to be able to uh, have additional resources uh, for those students, you know, to bring the bottom up. And so to that end, the structure is such uh, that tier one, we, any new funds, so everyone has a whole harmless piece, uh, from the original amount when it was first initiated, the calculation, general state aid, which you had, special ed, uh, reimbursement costs, and, and, and bilingual grant rolled up about five different uh, funds and put them into one, and then based it against the, you know, the EBF that first year, and, um, and that was you know, the, the baseline level. And then additional money has been placed on there ever since. So, Tier one groups get 50% of the, any new money that goes in. Tier two, well, the next 49% goes to tier one and two. The next nine tenths of a percent goes to tier three, and one tenth of a percent goes to tier four. So tier four is really essentially not going to get. There are some districts that look was looking through the list. Um, there are a few districts in the area that got $500 increase uh, in state funding. Um, this year because they're already over exceeding 100% of what the adequacy target would be. So, Todd, um, just real quick so the board knows, that the way it used to be set up what it, before the evidence-based funding model is there were three levels of funding. Um, we would have been in what's called the flat grant uh, funding. So that's where your district is getting a certain dollar amount per student. And that was around $180, does that sound about right? Yeah. About 179, $180. Yeah. And there was a middle level called the you know alternate level, and then there was the foundation level. The the problem that the state came into with this is is they never could fully provide districts with what they promised. And so what they would come back is they would say, yeah, we don't have enough money to pay you, so what we're going to do this year is we're going to prorate all districts what we we're going to give you. So instead of getting all that money, we're only going to give you 89% of that money. So that was that's an example of that. So. In districts that were heavily dependent upon state money, when they got prorated, it really hurt them disproportionately to districts that had a flat grant from state funding because 89% of you know $181 per student is a lot different than 89% um, percent of you know 6,000 per student, so to speak. And so that's the whole intent here is that they level the playing field with this funding formula. What it does do, though, for districts like Downers Grove that are already heavily burdened with local taxes, uh, especially the property tax, it forces the towns like ours to be more reliant on the property tax, which, which can be very painful uh, locally as well. So new money this year uh, for fiscal year 20 for the state was about $312 million. So the example of 300 is pretty close to what actually happened uh, this last year for the state when they funded so the first tier got $150 million. Then the next two tiers, or tier one and two, then split 147 into you know, 2.7 and 0.3. That would be where the $500 comes from out of that 0.3. 
uh, or three hundred thousand uh, dollars for uh, tier one, tier four schools. And then I'll go back a minute here. So, fifty-eight school districts split that two point seven million dollars for tier three. One hundred and fifty-one districts split that three hundred thousand dollars. So. kind of rounds to zero in the report for most of it. So that's what the, the funding model does. And, and when you see, yeah, we, we are at 97% this year. Um, our, the amount that we received is $3.3 .3 million. We received a, a $127,000 increase from the prior year. So it's not, a, I mean, a couple teachers' salaries in there. Um, you know, it's important that we, you know, and every dollar is important and a good dollar. Uh, but it's not a substantial amount of revenue from the district. This is the table that we do, the recap table every year, um, and we're not going to go through this because it's not readable, but we wanted to go to and talk about this in a graphic format. Because um, when we start talking about levels of funding and levels of expense, uh, there are things we can do and adjust what the evidence-based funding model does um, and things we can look at. But the reality is, you know, most of our impact and most of our revenue is coming from, you know, property taxes, which is the big, the big blue line. And most of that, obviously, is in the educational fund. Uh, you have the other pieces of uh, local other resources and, and state aid and so forth. Um, I'll point out that under capital, that little green line back over there, oh no, see, there it is, that piece right there, that is that capital money that we've budgeted for, I should say, you know, for the, the playgrounds for part of that state piece, you know, that's in there on the capital side. The one nice thing about keeping it in the capital side is it's kind of segregated out, and so it doesn't get into conversation of inflating our operational uh, pieces, you know, both on, on both sides of the equation. But we wanted to just kind of give that as a graphical representation to show, you know, comparatively where the majority of the money is coming from. And we do it again with a pie graph that we, you know, we have in the, some of the memos to kind of give a sense as to the amount of, of property taxes, particularly, you know, 16%, almost $12 million comes in from non-residential property. You know, from our commercial industrial base, most of the industry, which is a really important piece uh, and, and, a, and a great asset. Looking at the expense side, and this is by object, so you can see kind of a breakdown of salaries, benefits, purchase services, supplies, so forth, um, tuition and other. You see that, that green piece over back there. That largely is um, SACID and private placement. So conceptually, it is also salary and benefits in a format that we are, um, you know, just someone else's that we're, that we're writing and paying for. So we get a sense as to how much you know, the salaries and the benefits are comparative to everything else. We talk about what we can do and make adjustments. There are things we can do and adjust other places. Um, but then again, there's still those, those limits that we're going to have and making it you know, significant impact. And then again, we have a, you know, just a pie graph that gives you a sense of stuff overall. Questions on that piece, mainly focusing on the, on the revenue side. Obviously, we get into uh, January with the board and talking about uh, in February on the expense side for when we Start, as we're working through fiscal year 21 and projections, and we'll have those, um, you know, <coughs> the and staff work through those pieces and what we'll have coming down the road. Okay. When you all adopted this fiscal year 20 budget with a very, very thin uh, fund balance add, uh, we had a conversation and we followed that up with the memos and so forth about fund balance and the concern that um, we have a dangerous low cash balance points uh, into the spring before that tax bill, those early taxes come in. Um, 
Sounds great. I, I just want to add, this is a, a topic that there is a bunch of uh, area business managers, uh, other people are reviewing this right now for their policy, and so we've all been changing out, changing what the policy is, and or what the policy that what people are thinking about on fund balances. So I'm kind of getting some the background about that simultaneous to, to our conversation. You have the salary benefits for salary uh, salary benefits budget of fifty three million dollars and accounts payable of fifteen. What we calculated was for June that that first June bill list that the board has when they approve the bills in June as well as that first payroll in June uh, is right at the point where we're getting some tax, early tax money in, but right at the end of May when we're at a very low tax point. Um, so we calculate out what we really need to have in the bank to cover those bills is about $4 million. We estimate right now, our projection would be that we're about $65,000, $66,000 under that amount. Now, you know, we'll, we'll figure out. We don't think we're going to have to go borrow $70,000. Um, first off, last year we did get a fourth payment. This doesn't, does not anticipate a fourth categorical payment in May. We did receive that last year. We don't know if we received it this year or not, but that's a possibility. Also, you know, we'll do things to make sure we've got enough on hand to make sure payroll and benefits are all taken care of. Um, and, and we'll, you know, we won't have that problem. But that money also includes the sinking fund. And so as we're talking about looking at a policy down the road, we've talked about in the last year about the fact that we have a sinking fund in name only. Sinking fund was set aside, is set aside interest income um, to help build for capital needs in the event we replace the roof or have emergency purposes and so forth. Right now, that money sits in as a sub-fund of the operations and maintenance fund. It's an operational fund. Right now, we that amount is included in that $3.9 million of what we have on hand to pay bills. So when we're looking forward what we need to do to build a policy that one has enough cash on hand to pay the bills at that low cash point, but also starts to free up that sinking fund so that we can eventually move it to the capital fund and use it when we need to use it. All of this aside, we come up with a plan that we start to say, okay, over a five-year period, we put $200,000 that every year when we create a budget that revenue must exceed expenditures by $200,000. So we're adding to the fund balance two hundred thousand dollars going forward. That helps work that way through, and then from that point, we're making sure that you know fund balance to expense is a is a is a percentage piece and grows as expenditures grow. If expenditures decrease, then that may give some room in that piece or allow us to to build a little bit more ahead. But you know, working over because to take a million dollars out or eight hundred thousand dollars out of a budget at this point is just not a feasible thing. Um, unless we have, you know, I'm, I'm sure even if we had a large increase in, of $800,000 of revenue, we have a large amount of needs that we would like to do that with. Um, and we think we can manage this piece over the next four to five year period. And the additional property tax piece that come in a little better than, you know, than projection, you know, that helps out, that helps out the overall uh, at the end. So that, there's the math and what we were talking about putting the policy together that would, uh, as we start to look at building the budget going forward, when we add up and we start balancing things, that's the piece that we'll look at as kind of our zero point, which is, I think, what the board had kind of alluded to and talked about uh, at the September board meeting as to what we needed to do uh, when they adopted uh, your, you know, your 20, which is coming up with something. So looking at this and kind of starting to look towards how do we write into a policy because obviously a math table isn't what we do in policy. 
is essentially looking at a 30% of, the, you know, the fund balance seems to be about 30% of the annual budget expenditure. And that would, you know, and, and that would be the trend that we need to move to. Which isn't, when we look at where we're at, we're not too far off. Um, you know, it, it's it's a it is a difference of a million dollars, but we're we're not moving two or three percentages. We're moving a half a percent. So that would be kind of the piece moving forward that we would work through the FAC. Uh, and policy committee, um, and, you know, and, and, and bounce around. I'm also looking at this as to what some of the others have, and it's, it's a fairly, this is a low, I will tell you, this is a lower cash side fund balance policy. Uh, some other districts in the area have much larger balance policies, um, you know, in their, in their structure. Uh, they have so many days cash on hand. And so many percentages and so forth. So, um, you know, just put this at the bare minimum what we would need. But it also means that we would not be looking at, certainly not looking at any deficit budget uh, in, in the near future. In fact, you know, we would say anything under $200,000 to the positive, it would be a deficit. Position. Questions on that? I have, can you, um, the 30% number, can you tell me where you drive that from? So the current projected ending balance is, okay, okay, so 30%. The budget operational expenditure is at $70 million. So when we figure out how much that million dollars is to move, we need to get to 30% of 21,090. Okay, so it's a target that we've established, not some it's kind a, of like it's best a, practice. It's a, it's a target based on, right, so what we worked, I worked my way back, okay, from here. So we want to free up that nine hundred thousand right. dollars, and we say about two hundred thousand. So just kind of going through that piece as to what we need as the, at that low cash point, and then what is that? You know, putting that amount into what's our ending balance, projected ending balance, that comes out to be about thirty percent. So you're proposing drafting a policy that states that each fund should have thirty percent of the of the fiscal year's operational cost. Overall operating fund. The overall operating fund would need to be at 30 percent that we would work toward the goal to get there uh, over five and to, to reach that over a, a four to five year period sure. and the benefit to that then is to make this two you would avoid any kind of talk about tax anticipation ones number one and number two is to truly have a capital or a sinking fund where you could replenish over time for maintenance needs and maintenance projects, which was the original intent, but unfortunately right now with the district's financial position is, is that's kind of our bank account to make sure that we avoid tax anticipation ones right now instead of using it for maintenance. The, the $200,000 over the next five years, that's to get us caught up. And then is the policy after that going to be looking at just maintaining? Maintain the 30 Calculating 30%. every year what the increase should be to get to right. that 30%. Yep. To Todd's point from, you know, and, and Darren, you said this at the FAC, the board worked very hard to get out of deficit spending. You're there now with a balanced budget. Now, how do we take that next step? So I think Todd made a really good point. Anything under $200,000 to the positive would be viewed as a deficit spending budget mm -hmm. um, to, in order to get us there. So that would be, okay, so going on, the goal would be to, you know, maintain 30%. Pat, can you talk about, <clears throat> this is, this feels like one scenario, right? Let's build for this scenario of having $200,000 more in the bank every year, building towards a $1 million increase in our fund balance. Um, what are, I imagine you thought through a couple of other ways you could splice it, right? What are other scenarios on the less aggressive and the more aggressive end that we, we could decide alternatively to go for. Um, just trying to think through, like, 2021, a roof needs replacement, right? 
that's a significant, call it what, uh, $200,000 at least in cost that we, in our current budget, don't have, and two years from now we'll barely. Uh, and so if we, if we think about like the, the, the challenges of what are we assuming is true to allow us this five-year run rate to build up that fund balance, what else could we do to be even more safe or possibly even be more aggressive on the other end? So to, to be in an aggressive position on increasing that fund balance to get there faster, obviously, you know, that 200000 would have to be more than that, 250000 yep. 300000 whatever, um, which also would mean that we would have less, we, we would have to look through and determine uh, how to impact the program because a revenue stream is, you know, is it not in, you know, it's increasing that CPI plus whatever the new property is because that's where the majority of the money comes from, um, whatever increase in fees and so forth is the CPI number. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be playing, yeah, all of that, all of the new revenue is going to be allocated fairly quickly by current program structure. Doesn't mean that we need to always continually look to see what we can do. Uh, you know, we've made lots of, you know, we've been making lots of tweaks and changes and adjustments throughout, you know, the process the last year or so to even to find ways to save some money. So those pieces continue on, but literally we'll, you know, we'd be having to look at what our program does to, to increase that fund balance. Yeah, you know, on, on the other side, we could be under that 200 and extend out from the, you know, the five-year uh, window uh, to a longer six, seven, eight year window, which would, you know, slow down that piece. And, I mean, as long as you're positive and putting what your expenditure increases into that fund balance, we would be okay with covering expenses into that May period to have that cash flow. We just would not be able to, to build over, you know, enough to eventually move the, the capital piece over. On the scenario of, you know, we have to place a, replace the roof. Um, <coughs> I, there are a couple options. There's one, we, we, pay, we pay cash. And, you know, that would have either impact the fund balancer, expenditure, or both sides, depending on how we did that. The other would be is looking at we have capacity to go issue bonds. They're out farther. We, we have a window that there is um, that we could go issue under our tax, our debt service extension base. Um, but that has a longer window out and has an interest rate at risk and cost to it. Um, that would be you know, an additional piece. But that that exists for the next two years if needed be. One of the other things that the district is actively monitoring, and we certainly don't have numbers to, to share, so I want to be very cautious with this, but there are TIFs that will be coming off um, as well, um, you know, especially the downtown area, that could have an impact to our budget, um, but those are a few years out, and so, of course, those will certainly help perhaps accelerate this time frame when you're getting more money in, um, in terms of property tax revenue, but in terms of what that dollar amount looks like, it's still a little early to, to say that, but. That is, so what you've seen up here is a very conservative estimate. There are still some other things that can come off in forms of a TIF that would help that. Other questions on the fund balance, please? The last piece I want to talk about is comparisons to other local districts. So we have a system we use is uh, called Forecast 5, and it puts all of, it grabs a lot of data from uh, the state and all other sources, and we're able to do some comparison pieces. So this graph is the tax rates for since all the elementary districts in DuPage County and surrounding. See, we are here. This is our rates over 16, 17, and 18 um, levy years. Gower is a little lower on a, on a rate. Um, a lot of them are higher. A tax rate comes from two different things. It comes from the ability to ask and what the amount of money you can get 
out of your levy, but also deals with you know, what your tax base is and your assessed value. We have a very large tax base. We have almost $2.8, $2.9 billion in tax, in, in property tax base, which is a considerable amount of money. So, um, so we're very fortunate in that, and that helps produce, along with the district not having to have a referendum in a very long time, um, a lower tax rate. So we're at about $1.90 on our living rate. Right. So, you see, we live in, you know, the one example we look at is Woodward. And, you know, this is total tax rate, which includes bonds and debt. Uh, and you can see that there is um, a little bit higher. They have a smaller tax rate than we do. Uh, but they have a much larger limiting rate and operation rate uh, than we do as well. And just for the board's perspective, why you don't see the high school districts up here is because high school districts that are not part of the unit school district, you can tax those at a different rate. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Right. And yeah. so that's why you don't see the high school districts up. So these are just elementary districts only. Could you go back one slide? Uh -huh. I have a dumb question. Thank you. Andy. You have a good question. In, in Hinsdale 181, from one year to the other, how did their tax rate go up? Also, in uh, 89. Um, How did they grow it? Grow it? 89 had a referendum. Mm -hmm. It's a rate referendum in the past. Uh, and Hinsdale, that because this is bonds, they could have issued bonds in that time, too. I don't know. They did for Hinsdale Middle School, the new building. So, so this is total taxes, operation plus bond debt. So if there is, you know, 89, I know, had a rate referendum, um, but also, yes, 181 then had bonds that they put on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How can I forget that part? Yes. Um, they had bonds that, that passed, and they built uh, a building. Um, yeah, so, so typically, Tracy, what you would see here is, is if EAV is going up, your tax rate is going to go down, and so that's where you would see the, the bars going to the right. But if there is some kind of a bond issuance or a, a limiting rate increase, you would see some anomalies like the, in District 89 or District 181. Okay. Yeah, you see most, yeah. Like obviously, you know, EAV has been growing the area in the last four or five years, so you're going to see that slide of the rate go down. Okay. So we did a little piece here. We took the EAV per student that we had for 2018. And we multiplied by the limiting <laughs> rate, or the operational rate for these districts, to come up with a property taxes per student. You can see Addison has 72.52 per student. We have 98.90 per student. And then what we did is we took our enrollment. Uh, enrollment was 51.35. That was reported through this. And we did a calculation to come up with if we had the resources of these other districts, how much money would we be less or more based on our enrollment? So if we had their taxability and what would our, you know, with our enrollment and our population, what would it be? There are two districts below us in that allocation, uh, Addison 4 and District 89. And then everyone else has more per student. Now, you know, not what they have in their budget. They don't have this much more necessarily, but it's, a, it's an allocation piece of what would it be if we had those resources. So Glen Ellen 41 would have about a million bucks. I would say this one is a bit weird because it is, there's an economy of scale piece to get to where it has a very small, something's over a, a small district that wouldn't make sense. Hinsdale 181, though, would be, a, I mean, it, it has about 3,000 students. It has a very strong EAV piece. But essentially, if we had that resource available, we would have another $13.5 million in operational budget to expend on programs and students. But it kind of gives you a sense as to what's available. Good okay, good. So, so if, we, if we kind of drive towards the apples to apples comparison, 
which one would you choose? West Chicago is uh, what's, the what's the closest? Yeah. Yeah. But their demographics are different. If you're different. talking just in terms of the size of the school district, like a large elementary school district, 181 in West Chicago are similar in terms of the number of buildings and in, in the uh, number of students. Now, West Chicago, in terms of equalized assessed value, probably isn't the same. Um, Hinsdale's probably similar. I, I want to be cautious, though, because every district is, is a little bit different. But when we look at the large elementary school district, West Chicago and Hinsdale on that list are going to be the closest ones. Um, Woodridge is, for example, about half our size in terms of school. They have six elementaries and one middle school. We talked about the evidence-based funding model format. And <coughs> there's a reason why. It's because we wanted to put the tiers and their adequacies in here to compare with us as well. Because you know, we're at tier three, we're at 96.8, it's at 97% adequacy. So you have Addison, which is at 68%. So they're, you know, they're $13 million under our level, but they've also got a considerable amount of new of, of state funds as well because of that EBF format, right? Uh, per student, um, you know, Woodridge is at 92 percent adequacy, so a little below it. And then you've got some others. Um, so on a size level, Hinsdale, you know, has it. But when you look at where they're at 135 percent of adequacy. Obviously, they have you know those those local resources piece, and that rate has an impact on what they have available to the students. You know, they're at 12.5 uh, compared to our, our 98.90. Um, you know, DuPage, uh, 45 smaller district. You know, they're a uh, tier two, and you know, they have additional funds as well on a local piece compared to And Steve, to go back to your question, because I think it's a fair one. It, it's so hard to compare apples to apples, but one of the things I, you know, just all cards on the table from the superintendent's perspective, I think one of the things that we struggle with in, in 58 is I think we often get compared, and, and rightfully so, to a community like the Hinsdale School District and things like that. What's tough, though, is, is when you look at how far over their adequacy target they may be compared to ours, that's where, when you're talking resources, it, it sometimes is a, is a tougher comparison uh, to make because they're obviously getting more resources than, than what we would have available um, to us. So there's so many numbers that, that come into play here, but I think that adequacy percentage is, is just a good one to look at to see where are the local districts compared to ours in terms of how they rank up, and that limiting rate is also, a, I think, a really interesting number to, to take a look at. What I also, though, kind of think about is if you were saying that Hinsdale's EAV is similar to ours, they're also educating 2,000 less students, right? And so you can't just exactly multiply Correct. the cost per student because we'd have to have a significantly larger EAV to be able to handle that. And so in some ways, like, I really like looking at this to understand the impact on what it is for our kids, but it's also not math that can directly be interpreted um, right. Because our limiting rate could get huge if we tried to equal the cost per student to a, to a Hinsdale who's using the same amount of money or more EAV to fund a uh, 40% less student. Right. So this is an EAV per student. So the way we do it is it assess value per student okay. times their tax rate to come up with what their, tax, what their available taxes per student were to do that comparison mm -hmm. piece. So we, we try to equalize out that, that piece by looking at what it was for the EAV per student. Okay. That, that, that is a measure, it was a measure used more significantly with the general state aid, still used with the evidence-based funding model, um, but it is a measure of, of, of local wealth and ability. And so that's one of the things we wanted to look at. Um, and even we've had conversations, you know, when we were, you know, negotiations about, you know, what we had available uh, in resources and someone asked us, thought that we had the same amount of level of resources for the school high, high school district, and I said, well, no, where their EAV per student is twice what ours is, because yeah, they're you know, 
size, but that's what, you know, and they have the same amount of food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we tried to equalize that up so that we had that piece to try to really show what it would be for the resource. And their borders are different than ours, too, which, I mean, right. that, and that's why we don't There's compare. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's, that's why high school volume. districts are so hard to compare. They, like, right. for instance, 99 has almost the exact same number of students that we do, but they have the whole EAB of Woodbridge, they have the whole EAB of Downersville and the Shaw team. So it's a little bit different in terms of what they're able to, to draw. This is the last slide we have the presentation. So if there are questions, uh, I know that there's kind of three different pieces to talk about, but we thought to start this way in this process, to talk about the resource side, to talk about the fund balance side, uh, and to talk about the comparison piece, um, you know, as we get into this, and then next piece obviously will be when we come into January, when we're really talking about projections uh, and, and program uh, adjustments and so forth, as what we have, you know, how we're going to spend resources and how they'll get allocated. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. All right, with that, that concludes the uh, financial workshop presentation. So we're going to go on to take uh, public comment. This is, the board is allocating 30 minute time frame for the extended opportunity for board and community communications. Anyone wishing to address the board is asked to state your name and school attendance area. You are encouraged to limit your comment to three minutes so that everyone has a fair opportunity to speak. We ask everyone to be respectful of time limits, be respectful of others, and otherwise abide by board policy. I did not think I would get up from assuming there are no cards, but if there is anyone that would like to speak, feel free to step forward um, and provide you a mic if necessary. Make that line single file, please. <laughs> All right. Then with that, we do have a couple of announcements. Uh, we have the policy committee meeting Tuesday, November 19th at 7 a.m. at the ASC. We have the legislative committee meeting on Wednesday, November 20th at 3.45 p.m. at the ASC. A PTA meeting and building tour Wednesday, November 20th at 6.30 p.m. at Lester School. And our next regular board meeting will be Monday, December 9th at 7 p.m. at the Village Hall. Uh, with that, then, is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is carried. The meeting is adjourned here at 7.51 p.m. <laughs>